Good morning and thanks for joining us here on Cincy Lifestyle for this Thursday. Happy New Year. You know what? I'm not sure how long we're supposed to be able to say Happy New Year, but I think it's good for at least the rest of the week. And Clyde has the day off today. Well, since we're only two days into the year, chances are a lot of you made resolutions to eat a little healthier. Well, we've got a guest who is going to show us a recipe. Woo, I'm looking at it now with olive oil as the star. This looks delicious. And I want to welcome Melanie Cedargren, who is our the owner of the Spicy Olive. Thank you so Thank much you for, for being here again. again. Always fun when you come, Wonderful. Melanie. Good. All right, talk about what you're going to make today. All right, well, so many people this time of year are doing uh, New Year's resolutions, and they want to eat healthier and have more um, whole, healthy foods in their diet, yeah. so that's what this recipe is all about. It features whole grains, okay. which I made barley, which is unusual. A lot of people don't um, eat barley, but it's a nice whole grain. I just cooked this up with a little olive oil and water and then chilled it. Oh. And then if you have gluten sensitivities, you could use quinoa instead. Oh. Or if you like farro, you could use farro. Oh. And then we're going to put a lot of different vegetables in it with a lot of different colors to make Let it. Let me look. ask first, yep. which olive, because you are you specialize in a variety of right. flavors of olive oil. Which one did you use for this dish? I'm going to use our Persian lime olive oil today. Okay. It kind of gives it a nice um, spark. It's a fun flavor. But any of our olive oils would be really good on this salad. This is just a combination that I really like. But you could use a garlic olive oil with this. You could use a plain mm. one with a, a balsamic vinegar. But this is a, a, one of my favorite combinations, the Persian lime and our honey ginger balsamic. Okay. And I'm going to add some uh, vegetables now. And you can go through your refrigerator and use what's in your refrigerator to, <laughs> right. to use up vegetables. But I blanched some fresh broccoli just to make the colors get oh, bright yes. so it looks pretty. I've got some Kalamata olives. It kind of gives it its uh, Mediterranean flair since I call this a Mediterranean barley salad. I've got some chickpeas. If you want some protein in your salad, yes. you could make this a main dish. So we're going to add the chickpeas. If you don't like chickpeas, leave them out. That's the fun thing about this salad. You can make it what you like. Uh, some fresh cherry tomatoes sliced. Purple onion, again, gives it more oh color. Oh, goodness. And then we're going to do some, I have a I zucchini love. here. Oh, but that's you could zucchini. Do, you could do cucumber if oh. you like cucumber. So just whatever's in your um, refrigerator, just clean it out and make a healthy salad. And that's, that's pretty much what it is until we dress it up. The last thing I like to put on it is uh, some feta cheese. If you have some feta cheese in your refrigerator, go ahead and do that. It adds like a nice salty taste to it. Ooh. And then a little parsley to finish it. To finish and it. then for our dressing, we're going to take a teaspoon of our roasted garlic champagne mustard that we mm -hmm. have at the store. Mm -hmm. So I have that in the bowl. And then we're going to add about a third of a cup of our honey ginger balsamic. This is a white balsamic vinegar. Okay. And it's flavored with some ginger. You see a nice brown color in there? It's all ginger Ooh. and some honey. It's just a delicious balsamic. And then we're going to drizzle this lime olive oil in there while I whisk it. You want me to help you with yeah, that? Yeah, you can whisk. You can whisk, and I'll, I'm gonna I'll whisk. drizzle. Okay. So this is a, a lime olive oil, fresh olive oil from the store. And when you make a dressing, you just want to slowly drizzle your um, olive oil into the vinegar, and it helps it to emulsify and helps it to stay together. Well, this is a delicious looking vegetable. You've got tons of vegetables in here. So tell me, if someone wanted to add meat, yep, what um, kind of meat would go well with you this? You could do um, a tuna. You mm -hmm. could do grilled chicken, oh. uh, anything that you like. Um, okay. Yeah, and just add it to the to the top of the salad, and then we're just going to drizzle this dressing mm. over the salad, and then to top it off or to finish it, I'm going to add one more healthy fat to it, <gasps> and that's fresh avocado. Oh. So, and I just cut it and score it, and then when you scoop it out, it's in chunks already. Oh my goodness. So this salad's got everything for your New Year's resolution it in really it. Does. All kinds of healthy good fiber, things. good yes. vegetables, it's protein. It's going to be very filling and very oh healthy. Goodness. All right, where can people find you? Get this recipe and learn to make it themselves. Right, we have a website, the spicyolive.com that has this recipe as well as many, many others. And we have three stores in the Cincinnati area. We're in Westchester um, in the Voice of America area, uh, High Park Square and also up in Austin Landing in the Dayton area. Okay. And we specialize in fresh olive oils, flavor balsamics, and the Westchester store also has wines. 
Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So. All right. And I've got one more quick question. Yes. Are you leaving this salad I'm going to leave this okay. for you. How <laughs> could I make this and not leave it with you? Okay. Thank you, Melanie. Thank we you. really appreciate you coming me. on the show. Well, when it comes to your four-legged family members, you want to make sure they're treated by others the way you would treat them. That's why one local couple decided to open a pet salon in the heart of OTR. Well, we got to go behind the counter at Wolf's Pet Spa. Take a look. <laughs> We've been in the industry for quite a while now. So, you know, we had worked at other places and kind of seen like how other people were doing things and we wanted to change it up a little bit because most salons you'll drop your dog off and leave them there all day. We wanted it to be a little bit more personal. So um, how we operate here is you drop your dog off. Um, we usually have a two-ish hour turnaround time. Get them in and out, we get started on them right away. They're hand dried straight through with all the extras and then um, we call 15 minutes before they're ready. And if you're able to get here within the 15 minutes, they don't go into a kennel. And if we, you know, have to Take longer than an hour from the call there's like a doggy day boarding fee just because we try to encourage people to pick up promptly we find it less stressful for the dogs and they don't have to stand around all day and hang out it's less stressful on the other dogs being groomed and there's not a bunch of barking and like foot traffic in here so we try to just keep it really mellow and relaxed i would say compared to most salons we really just give so much attention to every single dog that we specialize in everything i would say how jesse is really good with her show be sean you know we like to do a lot of show trims and fluffy dogs, but then it also comes down to where a lot of dogs need to get trimmed short if they're not getting taken care of. But then we have a lot of dogs like Morty here who sheds a lot and we use some really good products so we get out all their hair. You know, we really have a broad spectrum of the things that we specialize in. It's a very, it's a very relaxed place and you know, what, what better, who better to do your dogs than your friend, you know? Great people around, people that love dogs, people that want to care for your dogs. I get here, usually have a dog as soon as I come in. I do the dog straight through, uh, you know, bath, nails, ears, all that good stuff, de-shedding. Find detailed all of our products that we've used over the years, learning which ones were best, and um, I have to say most of the places that I've worked at in my journey, they've never had some of the stuff that we use specifically in like, you know, the shampoos or specific dryers and tables and things that, well, you wouldn't think a table would be very important, but the table can go to like the very, very bottom. And for dogs that are, you know, 300 pounds or have issues with their hips and whatnot, it's really hard for them to get up on a table. So a lot of the stuff that we do here just uh, sets us apart. We do work with a lot of dogs with skin issues. We have a lot of pets that have, you know, like handicaps with their, you know, like I said, like hurt hips and things like that. So we worked with a lot of pets like that have special tools to help them so there's a lot of people only do like smaller breed dogs they don't always do the large dogs and we definitely accommodate for all size of dogs we try to cater to all of our friends oh, that is so sweet well if you'd like to check out wolf pet spa you can find them on race street in over the rhine or check them out online at wolfpetspa.com or on facebook well, you probably already know that we have some of the greatest minds in science living right here in the Tri-State. And now there's a YouTube show that highlights all of the wonderful scientific things that happen in our area. And right now I want to welcome Chris Anderson, the host of the show Science Around Cincy. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. Hey, thanks for letting me. Let me come on, Mona. All right, and no problem. Tell us about your show, Science Around Cincy. So it's a web-based video series that features the different scientists and engineers that live right here in our hometown. So we get to go to their labs, check out what they're researching, what they're learning about the world around us. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of fun. You're going to learn something and, uh, you know, can't wait to talk more about it. Okay, so one of your videos talks about research done in our area. You want to talk to us about that with brain diseases, actually. Yeah, that's right. So Dr. Richard Liu at Children's Hospital researches the different genes that control for brain cancer, Alzheimer's, and multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool about that is he, he's able to alter some of the genes in mice that control for those diseases. So what he can do then is he can see how those genes are affecting whether or not the mice actually get sick and, and even like look for treatments to, to ba based off those genes gene changes. Okay, so the genes really play a big part then. Yeah, that's right. So there's a, a method called CRISPR that mm -hmm. lets him alter the genes at like a base pair level. So instead of like G's and T's and A's, he can switch those around to see how that affects whether or not the mice get, uh, get brain cancer or Alzheimer's. 
What? That's unbelievable. Yeah. That's amazing. So one of your goals is to get us to love science. Yes. Yes. So tell me how you're accomplishing that with your web series. Well, what we want to do is show how accessible some of these folks are, is that sometimes we think a scientist is just kind of cooped up in a lab and always you know, tinkering with things, but really they're, they're just people who have an insatiable curiosity and that's what matters. So it doesn't matter if you are a PhD student or if you're in elementary school, as long as you have that sense of wonder about the world around us, you're a scientist. Oh, well, I think I might be a scientist. You are a scientist. Probably not, right, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Tell us about trilobites. Oh man, so these are really cool creatures. These things <laughs> lived twice as long as the dinosaurs. They wow. lived for over 100, 250 million wow. years. And they lived in all sorts of parts of the ocean. So, you know, they swam through the ocean towards the top, they burrowed on the bottom, they were carnivores, they were, uh, you know, they ate plants, all sorts of things, uh, all sorts of niches in the ocean. And they lasted for so, so long. So what Dr. Brenda Hunda does, she looks at what the trilobite fossils look like to see what the world was like half a billion years ago. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. Hey, we got to find out where we can reach you, where we can see the web series. Tell us all about it. So all our episodes are on our website, sciaroundcincy.com, and we do all our updates um, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at sciaroundcincy. All right, Chris, it's always fun when you come. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, you are making me a scientist. Okay, and that's no hard no simple feat, I should say. All right, well, coming up here on Cincy Lifestyle, beer for babies? Well, it was once a real thing. We talk about some of the more creative marketing campaigns that local breweries attempted in an all new edition of Cincinnati Curiosities. Keep it here. Great. Well, I want to give credit to Clyde Gray, who shot and edited that wonderful piece. Well, while the craft beer industry is booming right now in the tri-state, there was a time when the beer industry had to fight to stay alive. The beer industry even came up with some interesting ad campaigns, including ones geared toward children <laughs> before a legal drinking age was established. It's another Cincinnati curiosity. We remember the Roaring Twenties as a time when hot jazz, racy flappers, and especially speakeasies fueled one long, wild party. The decade began 100 years ago with Prohibition. The federal Volstead Act, banning the manufacture, transportation, and sale of alcohol, eliminated thousands of jobs and hit especially hard in Cincinnati, where 25 breweries supplied hundreds of neighborhood saloons. For more than a decade, Cincinnati brewers saw the handwriting on the wall and knew an army of temperance activists was making headway in the state legislatures and the halls of Congress. 
In response, Cincinnati's beer barons poured all their advertising dollars into a campaign aimed at building public support for beer, beer, and more beer. As a first step, the brewers abandoned their allies among the distillers by claiming that whiskey and other spiritous liquors were evil, but beer was a true temperance drink. Then the brewers proclaimed that beer was patriotic, hallowed in American history, beloved by sailors and soldiers. Even more damning, the evil German Kaiser was a known teetotaler. Next, the brewers tried to position beer as a health food, declaring that it was a bodybuilder, liquid bread, a health tonic created from absolutely pure ingredients and recommended as a medicine. In order to portray beer as a beverage consumed anywhere except those horrible smoke-filled saloons, breweries put beer drinkers outdoors, golfing, fishing, camping. 50 years before the Marlboro man sold cigarettes, Cowboys sold beer. Beer, the brewers declared, belonged at every family table as a sign of true hospitality, the perfect accompaniment to mom's cooking, and just the sort of drink to serve to your guests as they departed in their automobiles. As a last resort, Cincinnati breweries claimed that beer was an ideal drink for children of all ages, even infants. A series of updated nursery rhymes illustrated toddlers enjoying bottles of beer while playing or as a nightcap. The Christian Moorline Brewery abandoned all subtlety with an ad that plainly proclaimed that its national export beer was good for little tots. Alas, the campaign changed few minds. When Prohibition slammed the saloon doors shut, it claimed beer as a victim right along with hard liquor and other spiritous concoctions. For the next decade, spiders built webs in Cincinnati's abandoned breweries, while bootleggers built a market for bathtub gin. <laughs> and I want to welcome back the man behind these Cincinnati curiosities, Greg Han. Happy New Year to you. And to you, Mona. Always good to have you on. Okay, I got to ask, were they serious? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Mona. This was incredible. The beer industry, the alcohol industry, was so certain that they were going to hold prohibition at bay that they were getting a little cocky getting into the early 1900s. And when they realized the tide was turning, it was turning quickly. And they panicked. This was, after all, one of the top five industries in the United States at the time. They thought they were too big to fail. And the voters told them otherwise. So, of course, they were serious about this. <laughs> so then, how did the people respond to the ads? You know, it depended on your background. Mm -hmm. Because what they were really doing with these advertisements is is tying into the traditions of a lot of the families for instance in Cincinnati in German families you did start drinking beer at a very early age uh, you did uh, start enjoying beer as part of the dinner table and what they were really trying to do was to disassociate themselves from the saloons okay saloons evil home good and so their ads were were uh, were aimed at this family so you can be home with your family yes. enjoying beer and alcohol right. okay all right so was this a cincinnati thing or did other this was no, nationwide was... really this was absolutely nationwide one of the um one of the biggest proponents of this approach toward fighting prohibition was mr bush from the anheuser bush mm -hmm. uh, company he was uh, involved in providing uh, advertising materials throughout the South, throughout the East Coast, trying to fight prohibition. And most of his advertising was saying beer is a family drink. Wow, okay. So do you know around the time that the, they raised the age for drinking beer, when was that? The, uh, there have been several stages, but um, they started as a compromise once beer was legal again in the 1930s, saying, okay, we're going to make it legal, but it can only be over 21. And then and then for a while, you could get 3-2 beer. I remember the 3-2 beer at 18, right? <laughs> you couldn't possibly remember. I just remember it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't indulge, right? Yeah. Uh, for a while. And... Um, 
and, and, and so uh, eventually I think we're going to end up like Europe where 16 is the drinking age. Wow, okay. Where, where can people find you, Greg? Get more Cincinnati Curiosities. Just Google Cincinnati Curiosities and you will find my countenance staring back at you. All right, always a pleasure. Thank Indeed, you so much for coming on, Greg. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, we'll be back with more Cincy Lifestyle on the other side of the break. Plus, be sure to check us out on Facebook. We post all our guest segments and community stories there for you to watch and share with your friends. So like and follow us now at facebook.com slash Cincy Lifestyle. Nice picture of our skyline here in Cincinnati. Expecting a little bit of rain, I think, later on today. Well, coming up tomorrow here on Cincy Lifestyle, we'll introduce you to a group of gentlemen who are keeping the sounds of the temptations alive right here in Cincinnati. They're called Emperors of Soul, and they'll be right here to give us a taste of their sound. I'm looking forward to that. Plus, if you've ever been curious about candles, We've got you covered. We'll talk about the benefits of burning soy candles and even show you how they're made. All that, so much more happening tomorrow right here on Cincy Lifestyle. And if you have suggestions, ideas, comments, we always want to hear from you. So reach out to us. All the ways are right there on your screen. That's it today for Cincy Lifestyle, Thursday, January 2nd. Make it a great day. Thanks for watching our video. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button. You can also check out full episodes of the show you've never seen before or watch your favorites again and again. And as always, make it a great day.